I think uh, we will start it here. I'm too excited to wait any longer. Uh, so welcome and thank you for joining us today for South Pole's webinar, Biodiversity Investments, Platforms and Technologies, The Next Big Thing. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. and We're very excited to be speaking on this topic. My name is Alex Staples and I'm a Senior Business Development Associate with South Pole based in Sydney. I'd like to begin by first acknowledging the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land where I'm hosting this webinar from today. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands where you are joining us from and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining today. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please. Uh, so just a few uh, points of housekeeping. You have been muted on entry. That is in no way to discourage you from asking questions. Uh, please, questions are very welcome. Um, post at any time in the question box. We will have time for a Q&A at the end. And if we don't get to your question today, we'll be sure to get in touch via email. Uh, the session is also being recorded uh, and will be passed on to you afterwards. And you are welcome to share internally as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have a great panel of experts for our webinar today, and it's my pleasure to introduce, firstly, Dr. Liz O'Brien, the Chief Executive Officer at Queensland Trust for Nature. Liz will cover local and global trends in biodiversity investment. We are also joined by Victor Stephenson, who in addition to being the co-founder of the Firestick Alliance, Victor is an Indigenous writer, filmmaker, musician, and a traditional knowledge practitioner who will be providing insights into what biodiversity is and why it should be protected. And finally, South Pole's own Senior Sourcing Specialist for Carbon and Biodiversity, Ritwik Bilal. Ritwik will explain what you can expect from COP15 and South Pole's offering within the biodiversity space. Uh, so for those who may not be familiar with South Pole, I'll give just a brief overview. Uh, so South Pole is a profit for purpose company founded in 2006. We have a large presence in Australia with offices in Sydney and Melbourne and globally we're team, a team of more than a thousand. South Pole is a leading project developer and has provided climate finance to nearly a thousand projects in over 50 countries to reduce CO2 emissions and provide social be benefits to less privileged communities. Uh, we also have an extensive consulting arm to help companies develop strategies to turn climate action into long-term business opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have seen the business momentum for combining carbon and biodiversity efforts growing. And according to South Pole's latest net zero report, we found that 36% of leaders have a clear strategy and or targets for biodiversity. And 44% of leaders are exploring a corporate strategy to address biodiversity loss. And while this is good progress, we know that more action is needed um, as future supply chain resilience will center on adapting to external shocks. And some of the most critical elements to consider are water resilience and biodiversity protection. So as nature and biodiversity have been climbing up the corporate agenda, uh, we have seen new frameworks being developed. And this is very positive because as we've seen with carbon and emissions, this really catalyzes action. Such frameworks include the development of the new nature related financial disclosures driven by the task force for nature related financial disclosures TNFD. Best practice guidance on developing clear biodiversity strategies is also underway, led by the science based targets for nature. The accounting for nature framework developed here in Australia is an environmental accounting framework to inform better investment policy and management decisions in nature capital. Vera has also announced that it will develop a biodiversity methodology, uh, as well as the Australian federal government recently announcing the creation of a biodiversity certificate scheme and consultation is underway to develop the program right now. Uh, and finally, with the biodiversity COP coming up very soon, uh, which Ritwick will talk about in terms of what we can expect to see. So as companies come to understand what they need to address in order to keep running, it's evident the future of business will always depend on nature. At South Pole, we support businesses around the world to understand their relationship with nature by assessing impacts, risks and dependencies 
and financing activities that build resilient ecosystems. Uh, so with that, I will pass on to Liz, uh, who will take this further. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm joining you all from Yagara and Turrbal country, and I pay my respect to the traditional custodians, their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So the Queensland Trust for Nature, if we can go to the next slide, please. We're an independent not-for-profit, um, and biodiversity is our business. So our objective is to protect and enhance nature in Queensland. Next slide. We do this in a number of ways, by buying or receiving properties in Queensland which have high environmental value. We protect their natural assets with a legally binding nature refuge agreement and then we sell them back into the private market. Next slide, please. We've also been using environmental markets for close to 10 years now to fund restoration on a land, but we want to do it in a way that benefits the environment but also ensures that the landscape remains productive for people and businesses. Because biodiversity is our business, we monitor the global and domestic trends. So what I was hoping to do for you today is to share six questions that I hope might help you understand why nature and biodiversity should also be important to your business. So the first question to ask is how dependent is your business on nature? This is some work that was done back in 2020 by the World Economic Forum and they calculated that about $44 trillion of global business were either directly dependent on nature or their supply chain was dependent on nature. So the first question to ask yourselves is how dependent is your business on nature? The second question, what are the expectations of your banks? So a number of Australian banks are also looking at the businesses they loan to and how dependent they are on nature. So well, the example we have here is Westpac. They have commenced high level sector analysis across their lending portfolios and that's to guide their future understanding of nature related risks and opportunities. This table is from their latest annual report. They've included um, a ranking of sectors and it's not just on their dependency on nature, but as you can see here, it's also that sector's impact on nature. So the third question to ask, what are the expectation of your investors? This example here, this is the Norge Bank Investment Management Fund. It is the single largest owner in the world stock market and it has $1.2 trillion worth of funds under management. They've recently published their expectations of companies specifically around biodiversity and ecosystems. And they've also stated by 2030, they expect all of their investments to be nature positive. Fourth question understand the government's expectations. So we're joining you in this webinar today as a prelude to COP15, the United Nations Biodiversity Conference in December. And we've already got leaders from 94 countries, including Australia, who have signed the Leaders Pledge for Nature to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. So this is going to create emerging policies and regulations which might impact your business. Fifth question, understand your customers or your clients' expectations. This piece of work was done this year by the Union for Ethical Biotrade. They interviewed over 6,000 people from six countries and 84% overall. They're saying their expectations are that companies will take a stand when this global agreement for nature is adopted at COP15. So what are your customers and clients expecting your business to do into the future? And the final question that you can ask is, can being nature positive provide a competitive advantage for your business? Are there opportunities created by your business by being early adopters? So I think this headline from the Financial Review that was published in May sums it up for me. Nature positive is the new net zero. So at the Queensland Trust for Nature, we are looking at working with organisations to help them to be nature positive. And so I thought I could give you one example of what that looks like. This is a new building in the Brisbane Central Business District at 80 Ann Street. It was designed by Woods Bargo, uh, built and managed by Mervac and supported by the anchor tenant Suncorp. This building is designed to meet leading sustainability targets to ensure it delivers a positive impact for the environment. And this includes meeting the newly created six star Green Star buildings rating. For those that aren't familiar with Green Star, it's an internationally recognised sustainability rating for the built environment and it's Australia's only national voluntary rating system for buildings, fit outs and communities. 
One of the principles of the six star rating is to enhance ecological value and diversity. diversity so it's effectively to be nature positive. One of the options to be nature positive is to improve nature connectivity and waterway protection. And this is where the Queensland Trust for Nature plays a role. Next slide, please. We own and uh, manage this 2000 hectare working cattle station in Southeast Queensland, which also has significant um, ecosystem values. And it's on this property that we're helping Mervac achieve its nature positive ambitions for Adian Street. So we're storing, restoring eight hectares of habitat lining one of our creeks. And the restoration is not going to increase the diversity of the vegetation, but it's also going to support populations of koalas and other threatened species that move through this landscape. We're also providing support through our education to Mervac and Suncorp to help explain the value of nature. Next slide. So I'm hoping uh, that that quick little dip into nature positive and, and why nature and biodiversity is an important consideration for your business. So whether it's understanding your dependency or impact on nature, or is it about meeting the expectations of your lenders, investors, government, um, your consumers and clients, or the competitive advantage that it might create. So we see biodiversity as our business and, and hopefully you're gonna make it part of yours too. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Liz. Um, my name is Ritwik Balal. Um, I would like to begin today by acknowledging the Wangal people, uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm presenting today, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, next slide, please. So as the dust settles on COP27, uh, the curtain rises on COP15. So between the 7th and the 19th of December in Montreal, Canada, uh, governments from around the world will come together and agree on a new set of goals to guide global actions through to 2050 to protect and restore nature. So the Conference of Parties to the Convention on Biological D Diversity, so known as COP15, uh, will outline what countries need to do individually and collectively in the next decade and beyond to set humanity on a course for achieving the overall vision of what they call living in harmony with nature by 2050. So unlike the COP27, uh, COP15 is completely dedicated to biodiversity. So with governments leading the action, uh, we are hoping that the private sector will follow. Uh, next slide, please. So South Pole has been involved in uh, some supporting activities this year. Uh, so we are part of the World Economic Forum's Nature Action Agenda. Uh, we are also part of the World Economic Forum's workshops on biodiversity credits integrity principles. Uh, we've participated in many events, uh, such as the Biodiversity Congress in Amsterdam and the launch of the organization for uh, biodiversity certificates in Paris. And of course, we are organizing this webinar today. Um, so South Pole, uh, sorry, a previous slide. Yeah, uh, so South Pole will also be participating at the COP. Uh, we are organizing a side event uh, in Montreal on the 14th of December. Uh, and the target is basically to showcase biodiversity action and solutions. And we are also hosting a dinner uh, to basically uh, build strong relations. And as you can see on the screen, these are our partners who are involved with us. If you need more information about these events, uh, yeah, you can get in touch with us and we're happy to provide this to you. Um, and a video recording of the side event will be available and we're happy to share it with you after the event. Next slide, please. So uh, we are aligned basically with the, uh, the task force for nature related financial disclosures and of course the science-based targets networks. So while the framework for the TNFT is still being established and is expected to be published 
in September 2023. But we know that it talks about identifying, assessing, managing, and disclosing nature-related dependencies, impacts, risks, and opportunities. So this is a segue into setting science-based targets for nature and for climate. So nature loss is worsening climate change and vice versa. Companies tackling nature loss alongside climate change will help sequester more carbon and build a resilience to nature and climate related risks. So it will be easier for companies to solve both nature and climate solutions uh, by incorporating both strategies. Uh, and this will also drive cost efficiencies and increase innovations that are win-win for both the nature and the climate. So keeping this in mind, South Pole has a four-step process. The first is assessing impacts of your organization on nature or biodiversity, and also vice versa by prioritizing landscapes and metrics. This then leads to strategizing actions for positive actions of priority landscapes or vice versa, so actions in prioritizing landscapes with positive impact on the organization if your organization is directly dependent on nature. Uh, we also help in setting roadmaps and business strategies, and of course help in financing biodiversity projects for corporate le uh, leadership and resilience. And it's really important that organization communicate these actions to influence others. Next slide, please. So this is one such example where South Pole has helped Natura assessing its value chain and its impact and dependence on the nature. Uh, in addition to identify key locations or prioritize its actions. Um, so it allowed Natura to have a clear understanding of which environmental issue should be addressed and where in its value chain it will need to focus on for setting science-based targets for nature. Next slide, please. So these are the different national and international standards. Uh, so if you're interested in financing or certifying a project, uh, you can use these nationally or globally recognized standards uh, to certify ecosystem service benefits. Um, so national standards such as the accounting for nature, and of course, uh, the state biodiversity schemes and, and standards. And of course, there are international standards, and these are some of many, uh, which include the CCB, or the Climate Communities and Biodiversity Standard, and the VERA standard, uh, which is one of the most internationally recognized standards that offer the opportunity to certify progress in achieving landscape restoration and conservation objectives. So, yes, yeah, so basically, um, South Pole is here to assist you in the process. Uh, yeah, please get in touch with us uh, if you're interested in financing or certifying a project. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, so these are uh, some of the examples of uh, projects that we have worked in. Um, so one such example is of a project in Colombia where we are protecting 500 hectares in the first year, and then of course scaling up to about 2000 hectares in the following years. Uh, the objectives are preserving uh, and restoring uh, ecosystems, um, ecotourism, uh, cocoa agroforestry systems, amongst others. And we are using the VERA or the land scale uh, method uh, for this project. Next slide, please. Another example is from our APAC region. Uh, so we are certifying a CCB standard project in Indonesia. So we're protecting an area of 11,664 hectares, which includes 4,820 hectares of wetland and 6,844 hectares of lowland forest. So the objectives are avoiding plant deforestation, wetland restoration and conservation, and enhancement of vegetation conditions. And as I mentioned, we are using the climate communities and biodiversity standard uh, for this project. Uh, next slide, please. 
And yes, our last example is uh, from Australia, uh, which is the Mount Sandy Conservation Project in South Australia. So we are protecting 200 hectares. Uh, the objective is uh, landscape protection, habitat connectivity, and of course, community initiatives uh, for sustainable livelihoods. Um, the standards here are the South Australian Biodiversity Scheme and the South Australian Native Vegetation Credit Register. Uh, we are partnering with uh, Cassinia Environmental in this initiative and the biodiversity units uh, that are generated from this project are stapled with international carbon credits uh, and of course sold to our clients uh, and this is known as Eco Australia. Yeah, so that's all for me today. Thank you very much. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, my name is Victor Stephenson. I'm the um, co-founder for Plastics Alliance, also a, a Tuckalak descendant from North, Northern Australia um, in the Gulf country of North Queensland. Uh, and um, I'm also the lead fire practitioner for Fire Sticks as well. Um, through Fire Sticks um, Alliance is an indigenous organization that's been developed non-for-profit um, by communities on a national scale. So the work that we've been doing is reapplying traditional knowledge back into um, in landscapes and specifically around our fire management. Um, but the main thing around this is applying traditional knowledge to landscapes both for um, environmental um, um, environmental benefits but also social benefits as well. So what we do, we work with communities all over Australia in different parts that we're working with in um, training to rebuild knowledge of landscapes around traditional knowledge. So working with communities to with landscapes, sharing knowledge and principles and indicators through landscapes to rebuild those knowledge values back from country and understanding the identity of country and what country should look like, um, what plants should be in each individual ecosystems, and how that land has been managed for thousands of years to maintain that identity. And that also links in a huge importance around how we heal landscapes as well, and how we look at landscapes that have been cleared, loss of trees, um, filthy water systems, um, you know, weeds, and a loss of identity of landscape is really the underlying problem right across the globe. And when we look at the loss of identity, that's the same thing that happens to our people. We lose our identities. And it's the same philosophies for country as to our own people and communities. Once our young people lose their identities, then we see problems within um, socially within our communities. And it's the same within the environment. Once the environment loses their identity, it loses the old growth trees, it loses its elders, it loses the right trees for the right soils, then there's maximum problems that happens to the landscape because of the not the right identity, the right plants for those systems that have been um, kept that way for thousands of years by the custodians of country. So when we're reviving um, knowledge systems, it's really important for communities because as you know, the history um, alongside a devastating landscape is also um, devastating on, on knowledge as well and culture. And so for the loss of knowledge and culture, is also a clear indicator of um, aligning with the loss of nature because people have been aligned with this landscape for 60,000 years without destroying it. And just the fact that people have been on this country for 60,000 years plus without destroying it, that is an intelligence on its own. And it's an intelligence that we um, do not have today as a modern society and humanity. And it's an intelligence that we need to regain. So when we talk about healing landscapes and we talk about reviving country, it involves people as well. It's people and country together. And when we talk about our landscapes, it's not a nature reserve, it's a cultural landscape because people have evolved with those landscapes. And so when we look at the, the devastation across our country from fires, floods and, and the, the mass extinction and the impacts of climate change and changes in weather patterns, um, what we see is, um, you know, multiple uh, layers and a complexity of, of health problems across the landscape. And that, I think, is something that needs to be articulated to the world even further. People need to understand the fine detail 
about what is going on with our ecosystems and what needs to happen individually for each of the, each of those ecosystems to revive those systems. And not all of them require not all of them require um, tree planting, and not all of them require you know um, you know what people see or fire management and so all those things. They require multiple different applications of land management. And that's why for the um, different regions that we work with and different communities and helping them to um, revive their knowledge through landscapes, through knowledge sharing, is, is to help communities to understand the identity of landscapes and what's needed to heal those landscapes and, um, and the work involved to actually, um, to actually do that and, and to actually have the target more accurate around the work that we need to put into as people to reconnect with country and to apply the right management, particularly around fire and and um, around our harvesting knowledge and the way we use water holes and water and rivers as well. And so, when we look, talk about the skill set and healing landscapes, and we talk, look at look at the current for Australia, for example, um, this nation is not skilled to heal the landscape, and we see a loss of knowledge, loss of skills, and now because of the absence of fire and, and land management in, in Aboriginal practices in this country for so long now, we're, we're in a day and age where we have a population and people and humans don't understand the landscape. And we have conservation groups and national parks and other government run agencies and rural fire services um, that only put in fires to save life and property and they see um, the bushlands as a hazard. And we can't heal landscapes with that mindset. And so when we look at the revival of knowledge, it's also the revival of skill sets. And that's why what we're focusing through Fire Sticks is to ensure proper training models and proper um, knowledge exchange and knowledge building processes that speed up the, the understanding of landscapes, its right identity, and applying the, the right action and practices to country that not only heal landscapes, but revive culture, and also um, improve livelihoods as well within the mod mainstream sector, including how we also steer towards better agriculture and how we also steer towards a better economy system that's more aligned with our landscapes. This involves everything and does not separate species of animals, does not separate the fire management and, and the carbon, for example, in different ways. This is about the whole box and dice and, and how um, sustainable cultures in the past and how we model off that into the future. And that's exactly what we are doing with the Fire Sticks Alliance. When we look at the skill set and the training and the fact that the nation is not skilled, then we start to see programs uh, such as the carbon programs, which I really applaud those programs, the biodiversity markets, I think they're really great things. But I think there's more detail and fine detail in understanding what are the most accurate targets. And how is that simplified in a way that we understand it for each individual region and what they need, whether it's bringing back the water, whether it's taking out invasive trees that are, that are causing mass extinction, um, you know, whether it's putting the right fire management in to, to stop wildfires and to, and to also put uh, fire management in, in, in to enhance the right vegetation to grow in the, in the soil types. It's so complex. And that's why with us, we've started to create our own credit system that really touches on what our value, what we see as values are in a healthy country from the Aboriginal lens. And also looking at how we also look at, um, you know, um, um, the, these sort of schemes that also help with land and getting land um, access as well for Indigenous communities. So looking at our credit systems that also take up the challenges that are going across all tenure types. And when we look at national park systems and and other agencies and land, they take up the majority of our country in Australia. And when we look at Aboriginal innovation and Aboriginal, um, the, the ability for Aboriginal people to demonstrate the knowledge and, and, to, and to demonstrate the fine detail um, in all how we manage country, um, it becomes very difficult. And so that's why we're, we're working towards this sort of credit system and, and um, the offset sort of gesture to sort of work with us in a way that we can mould it that's going to suit our communities um, more perfectly, but also um, educate the world and fast track um, where we should be thinking and where we should be lying our targets. When we talk about carbon, yes, it's very general and yes, it's something we can't see. 
and it's also very complicated in how that's measured for a lot of our communities. But when we look at indigenous lenses of that, we're looking at health of landscapes directly, but not only the health of landscapes, but also how that also moves into um, benefits to our communities as well. So currently we're working with, um, we're seeing with our employment structures and how we develop our employment structures and how they are aligned with creating more benefits. So our employment structures are, are employing people from their own country. And when we employ people from their own country, that's the start of, of, re, of re-implementing that knowledge base back into those regions. And when we are creating employment structures that are strategic around re-implementing re knowledge structures back into our regions, but also um, employment structures that also enhance culture, knowledge transfer, and also allows people to have their dream job as well, a job that they, that they just dream about having and looking after the country and getting paid for practicing their culture that is a service to the community and a service to the world to um, investing in healthier landscapes and healthier communities into the future. And that's, for us, it's quite, it gets quite frustrating because we'll get a program of, a, um, we recently on my own country, we got a, a, a carbon project on our farm and it came with conditions of growing trees and all things that we saw that weren't the right targets for our landscape. We actually have an over overgrowth of trees and trees that are don't come from that certain ecosystem that's destroying and competing with our parent trees that belong to those ecosystems. And they kill our native grasses, they destroy our food sources, and then we end up with mass extinction with the overpopulation of trees. And so being able to articulate each individual case and show that show all this information and show how that links into indigenous knowledge and, and opportunities into improving many sectors in the mainstream, that's what we want to be able to demonstrate and be able to um, help guide the carbon markets and biodiversity markets in a, in a direction that's going to be um, a lot more feasible, um, a lot more accurate and a lot more beneficial around um, for communities on the ground, but also contributing to that bigger picture and how corporates and other um, businesses can see how um, they can pick up more information from Indigenous knowledge and those layers of complexity to how they can further structure their businesses in a more um, environmental way that supports um, the offsets and supports um, you know, a society that's more aligned with natural law and aligned with nature. And so for, for Indigenous programs, there are Indigenous programs doing carbon in Australia and doing these sort of initiatives, but uh, we feel that it could be better. And we feel that the carbon is a great thing as a vehicle and as a seed to um, beginning this process. But what we would like to see is more support and, and help around um, also just the innovation around Indigenous knowledge in a modern setting. And so supporting the fact of the training models and how we support, you know, um, the employment structures, uh, how we also support, um, you, know, um, you know, working with governments and changing policies. And, you know, the work that we're doing at the moment is, is um, so, uh, it's just so much work around so many divisions. I and mean, we were just talking about safety issues, insurance issues, and um, you know, and this is all um, part and dice on how we need to structure the right um, programs for our biodiversity markets for Aboriginal people. Um, and also, more importantly, how we also demonstrate um, and strengthen traditional knowledge and how it can be innovative in that modern setting as well. So, for example, we're working with. Um, um, people like law students, we talk with um, architect students and design um, in so many different fields and we're working with organic cattle farmers and in many parts in Queensland here um, and we're showing them that they don't need to use bulldozers and, and earth moving equipment, we're showing the importance of not disturbing the soils, we're showing the importance of native grasses and how important our native grasses are and the fact that our native grasses are becoming extinct in many parts of Australia and I'm sure in other parts of the world as well. This work that I've been doing with reviving knowledge as well, I've been doing in Canada as well, and sharing the same processes with some couple of communities there, which I'll continue next year. And I think that's going to be really, really, really important that we, um, when we give Indigenous knowledge the capacity to demonstrate itself, so it can um, influence better practice and can influence um, um, greater targets and fast track. Um, greater solutions as well, um, so that we're not 
doing, putting, investing into programs that actually are feel-good exercises, which um, not all of them are, but I see a lot of programs where trees are planted that aren't the right trees for ecosystems. And actually are trees that will cause problems down the track for the soils, cause problems down the track for so many reasons. And so we need more support for the communities and they need more research done in an indigenous way, action research. And we need to be able to have more capacity to demonstrate that to support other communities and, um, and sectors within the mainstream. So that's what we're doing with the fire sticks. And we're seeking um, um, help to be able to get our, um, our, our credits and, and our um, solutions on, on a broader scale onto the big market. And for us, for Aboriginal people, we have, um, we have a very small um, stage when it comes to um, voicing our opinions. And that has come with the colonisation of the country. But what we're seeking, we have great ideas and a very amazing knowledge system that can support um, this into the future in such a, an amazing way. Because there's one thing that will never go out of um, date. No matter how far in the future we go or how technical we become, natural law will never change. And that's where traditional knowledge sits. And that's the foundation of our future. So if we have more investment um, around even this, this the, um, the building of knowledge that tie into the carbon credits or how we get the carbon credit stuff to support um, support the innovation of knowledge and not just, okay, we're going to go and fix this bit of country up and who cares how they do it, but as long as we see trees, um, we want to see more detail. And we want to see detail that the investors can see as well. And, um, and, um, and we need this in Australia. We need this for all Indigenous communities around the world. So uh, thank you for listening. Just wait for the slides to come back. Thank you very much, Victor. It's uh, so important to hear the perspective of our traditional owners when talking and thinking about biodiversity. And we wanted to conclude with three takeaways before heading into questions. Uh, the first is to say uh, that climate change and biodiversity are inextricably linked. Uh, so companies must begin to address their impact by focusing on nature as a whole. Second is to align with best practice by following globally recognised standards and frameworks, as this is the best way to start and develop a credible strategy. And finally, to not delay action. We know that progress is very much achieved through collaboration and we must form partnerships to solve this issue, particularly leaning on the knowledge of Australia's traditional owners. So we will move into questions. And if you haven't had the opportunity uh, because you've been so intently listening to get your question in, uh, it's not too late, so please go ahead and enter it now. Um, as you do, we will kick off with those that have come in. Uh, so firstly, and I'd like each of our speakers to weigh in on this if possible, uh, the first question is, how do we communicate the work we are doing in biodiversity, and does the topic face as much scrutiny as carbon? I'm not sure if someone wants to jump in. I was thinking perhaps we might start with Liz. Um, I, I think what's what's actually coming because of the carbon markets that biodiversity will be heavily scrutinised. I mean, particularly in Australia, we are reviewing how our carbon markets are performing. And I think as we bring in new biodiversity markets, either whether they're sovereign backed or they're voluntary markets, like the great work that, that Firesticks is doing, um, the, the pressure on having that verifiable evidence is going to be really critical. So part of it, in terms of communicating, I think having that verified third party system. So for example, um, we, we use Accounting for Nature's standards to be able to have um, an assessment of, of the quality of the work that we're doing. And I think then when you combine that with the stories, um, the, the data, the evidence that helps us then communicate. But I do think there will be a lot of scrutiny. Um, we've got ASEC looking at greenwashing of businesses at the moment. So I think we can learn from that as businesses and not fall into the same trap just start by trying to under identify dependencies and impact. And then when you do start moving into this sort of nature positive space, don't over um, oversell what it is that you're doing. Just, just start because I do think the scrutiny will be quite high. Thanks, Linz. Victor or Ritwick, anything to add? 
can read with yeah um yeah i just feel that uh, with good communication is really important especially for biodiversity projects uh because there is a good understanding i feel about um climate change and net zero and carbon projects uh but in regards to biodiversity projects i feel that um, there's still a lot to learn um so yeah so with good communication uh and good communication you know led by associating you know with good projects uh will then lead to that uh will lead to that change yeah and you know and that's that's i'll just reinforce what was said there that you know there's there isn't a lot that people understand i mean people look at landscapes today they don't know what they're looking at I mean, I get even people who are, are professors and scientists and environmental scientists that come on the country and they don't see the identity of that country that we see how it was for thousands of years. And and so there needs to be, um, you know, just a lot more um, work around education and, and make sure that the biodiversity um, structures, they're talking to us and they're learning from our processes as well. And that um, we're not just seeing indigenous people um, just doing something that's um, been developed by someone else, but we see more innovation for us to be involved in those um, biodiversity outcomes and the methodology as well that's applied to healing landscapes. That's all I can say. Mm. That actually leads in well to our second question, uh, which is for Victor, sort of builds on the same idea. The question is, how can traditional land management practices adapt to climate change? Well, that's the thing. Indigenous people is all, and indigenous people's knowledge about managing land is is about adaptation. And so, when we look at climate change, it's all about healthy landscapes. Climate change is human induced, and it's something that has been um, it's some, it's because they've been mistreating this planet for so long that Mother Earth has been giving these indicators for so long, and all those indicators that's on Mother Earth is exactly what we read as indigenous people that tell us how we need to respond and how we need to react and how we need to live with the planet. Because so long that humanity has been ignoring these indicators of the planet, now the sun starts stepping in. And he's saying, well, you haven't been listening to the mother for so long, I'm gonna come in now and step in and heat up a bit the world because you're not listening to the planet for one. So see if you listen to me being the big boss on top. And so now we get to that situation. and it's all because we've misused landscape, it's because we haven't understood how the identity of country is because we allow um, plants from other areas to live in other soils, it's because we allow people to destroy landscapes and clear lands. Indigenous knowledge is natural law and is based off natural law. Indigenous governance is, is based on it's a sustainable model that's based on natural law. And that's the ability to be on country for thousands of years. So when we look at indigenous knowledge of country and the management practices that apply to that and the understanding of, of, of landscapes through languages, through names of language, um, of titles of places, to knowledge of places, then we get a really integral and very um, um, defined understanding of the landscape, its identity and how we can actually see the, a real positive response from country, from human action and human um, involvement. And that's that's the whole point here. Indigenous knowledge not only helps us with healing landscapes and with improving climate change outcomes um, on an environmental, environmental way, but also on a social standard as well. If we understand the natural law principles, then we'll be better at inventions and better at technology, better at house building, better in so many ways. And we haven't even started innovation using indigenous knowledge in this world even as yet. So. Um, th th there's so much that can come from understanding landscapes more intimately as Aboriginal people have done for thousands of years. Mm. Mm. We've actually, uh, thank you Victor, we've even had a, you're really sparking people's brains working because we've had another question that really builds on that so I'm going to come back to you. The question is how do you think we will bridge the gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous knowledge in, in, in developing these frameworks? Well, bridging the gap will only come from from um, giving people a go. I mean, when we look at what we're here in Australia, we're struggling. I mean, Aboriginal people, are, you know, for us it's about sharing and sharing, and that's why it's so generous. We get out there, do workshops, and share our knowledge in a bid to uh, that the broader community are going to listen 
get on board, work together and fix these problems and ensure that everyone um, benefits from that. And so for us, we're a very generous race of people. And that's the same for a lot of indigenous peoples around the world that just want to see um, working together with, um, you know, the Western um, knowledge systems and, um, you know, the border knowledge and technologies and Western science. And we can bridge those gaps, but it can only come with giving us a, a chance to demonstrate. We can't get a chance to demonstrate. We get hit with legislations. We have, um, we have a world of capitalism. You know, and that capitalism not only lies within corporates and and in the business world, um, where one man can own a trillion dollars and the rest of the community environment suffers. You know, that model destroys us, and so that capitalism also is entrenched within our government systems. And so we also have um, national parks and other agencies, rural fire services that take ownership, and instead of seeing it as a community and a responsibility for the community. Um, you know, and, and that's where um, the, the troubles are for Aboriginal people. We can't demonstrate our knowledge. We can't find land to be able to manage. We can't um, um, get the support. And yet um, it's a continuous, um, you know, um, frustration of watching, you know, after those wildfires in 2020 to see the, the Western divide just, just put steroids on what they're already doing wrong. I mean, you know, what we want to see, yes, they can come together, but we need to see um, more capacity given to Aboriginal people and, and Indigenous knowledge systems to be able to demonstrate itself. And, and at the moment, we're still struggling to get that full demonstration and full capacity to, to share that knowledge with the world. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Um, the next question, it would be great if Liz and Ritwick could both weigh in on this. The question is, do you have any recommendations of technology platforms or services that can be a building block for corporates to start addressing the TNFD LEAP frameworks? I'll let you start, Ritwick, on that one. Yeah, um, this is a very hard question because, um, yeah, we're just at the third version uh, of the TNFD. Uh, the fourth version will be released sometime in March next year. and um, yeah, the, the full uh, version will be adopted sometime in uh, September uh, next year. Uh, so we're still following the TNFT and see what comes out of it. Um, but yes, there are various uh, metrics uh, that are recognized around the world. Um, and then, yes, there's definitely something that uh, organizations can align with. Uh, in Australia as such, um, we are still building a metrics uh, in which which can assess the impacts or risks of operations uh, on nature, and then yeah, we're just watching this space really. Yeah, I'll add to that as well. Um, following on that same vein, it's it's such a moving feast at the moment. Um, there's certainly so many platforms out there. So I think that the principles of the TNFD are really good ones. So looking at locating how you're interfacing with nature, then evaluating, are you dependent on it? Are you impacting and then starting to assess the risk? Like just, just start with something because I think it's just gonna keep changing. And the other layers that are gonna come over the top are the other regulations. So Europe's already indicating the, the types of regulations that companies are expecting to meet or having um, the way they wanna see the, the nature related financial disclosures. So I, I'm gonna to have to say the same answer as it's, I can't recommend anything yet, it's too early. Thank you both. And a question back to Victor is, how could we make sure that carbon and biodiversity markets projects are aligned with Indigenous knowledge for each area? Could there be an additional Indigenous knowledge and culture certification process? Yes, uh, they, no, like, so for us, it's about addressing each region separately. And so what we would do, like when we work with communities, we you know, we, we can see what they need to do to look after their land and how we actually communicate that back and how we can also start to look at, um, you know, the players in that, in, in the carbon markets and biodiversity markets to actually come and work with us and help us to structure that the right way so that it can be put in the right language to share that with people and the right structures in the programs as well so that we can um, be accurate with each region, each place not only with the targets and what to invest in, but also the support the community needs to be able to undertake those targets 
and also where they can also um, grow to be more innovative around social enterprise and, and other aspects, um, education and, and just cultural well-being and community well-being, you know. So uh, for us, um, you know, we need more support. We're only young in the sense of getting involved in this sort of stuff. I mean, we have the Aboriginal Carbon Fund as our partner as well that's helping us do work, but still only small players within the midst of things on the global scale. And so we're, that's why coming today and trying to get more support on how we can, um, you know, get involved in that process and really help paint that picture and, and campaign um, and educate um, these sort of programs that could be quite exciting for people and more easier to understand around um, what we need to be doing into the future on multiple levels. Mm. Thank you, Victor. And this looks like our last question. Uh, so for Ritwick, do we think there will be more biodiversity projects developed or invested in by companies in Australia like we have for carbon? Yeah, um, I would like to say yes. Uh, that's because Australia has a compliance scheme for biodiversity in New South Wales, which is the biodiversity offset scheme. Uh, and so biodiversity projects are already being developed to offset impacts of uh, major projects on biodiversity. And now we uh, recently heard the announcement of a federal voluntary biodiversity scheme, which would work as a certificate uh, that uh, private companies can purchase. Um, and of course, we have uh, many uh, frameworks within Australia, such as the accounting for nature, uh, amongst others, that are really leading the way for uh, not only registering, but also certifying biodiversity projects. So I would like to say yes, uh, in Australia, I think we're pretty progressive when it comes to biodiversity. Thank you, Ritwick. Uh, well, that concludes our questions and uh, we have four minutes left. So I think this would be uh, a good time to wrap it up. So I would like to thank you all very much for attending. I would like to especially thank our speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise today. This is certainly a topic um, that we all feel very passionately about and we welcome the opportunity to discuss uh, any of these topics further. Uh, we can all be reached uh, via email, connected with on LinkedIn, and we will share the recording afterwards as well. Uh, so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks.